evening. Uh, it's 4 o'clock here in San Francisco. Um, and I should tell you, this is my first ever web conference. So um, do fill out the, the feedback uh, material at the end so that I can learn and grow and develop my uh, capacity on this new technology, well, to me, very new technology. Um, so I'm going to begin with a prayer uh, that may be familiar to many of you. It's from the Book of Common Prayer. Um, so the Lord be with you. Also with you. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your spirit, that we may know Christ and make him known, and through Christ at all times and in all places, they give thanks to you in all things. Amen. Amen. So, and I suppose um, we're going to move, I think, to the third slide, so I maybe can click that for you. There we go. Um, whoop, one back. There we go. Um, so I want to begin by reflecting on that prayer with you, in particular one line, and that is loving care on every side. I wonder if most of our churches um, feel loving care coming from them on every side. And if not loving care, what are we feeling? If we are feeling loving care, how does that loving care manifest itself? Does loving care necessitate showing up on a particular day of the week for a particular event or activity? What if loving care on every side was not just about us being loved, but our showing love as well? Who are the hardest neighbors for us and our congregations to connect with? What would an intentional and committed effort to express loving care on every side look like in your context? How would living into that practice of cultivating loving care manifest itself? How would it begin for you and for your congregation? I'm going to begin with um, three stories, actually, and then I'm going to reflect with you on uh, scripture and then we'll talk about some resources um, and some ideas for engaging your neighborhood. And as I said before, I am very new to this. Um, and it's also kind of we're not where we need to be in the 21st century so that we can have more interaction. So there's going to be a lot of me, but there are a few places in the program where you'll, you'll get a chance to, to, to participate. Um, and my preference is for that. Uh, that engagement to be back and forth a lot more. But we only have an hour, and uh, ECF wants me to talk to you. So I'm going to do that. So I want to begin um, by talking about uh, a, an experience of not feeling the love. Um, and it's, it's the story that takes place on Christmas Eve at St. Cyprian three years ago. So another young local minister and I decided that we wanted to be bold and have a joint candlelight service. Neither of our churches at that time had many local neighborhood members. His church had long stopped holding, holding Christmas Eve services because the elderly members 
um, didn't go out at night. And my church had a long tradition of candlelight services, which usually were a big production, whether anyone showed up or not. The service actually went quite well. And as I left to go to another church's later night service with my spouse, and I was walking to my car, we walked past uh, our immediate neighbor who was standing out front of his house drinking with a friend. And as I walked by, I said, Merry Christmas, and smiled and waved. And he turned to me, and he basically started shouting and telling me off and telling my congregation off. And the more he shouted, and I tried to listen, the more I realized that underneath the surface there was a lot going on, and that somehow he felt my church had betrayed him by not reaching out to them after a small fire that occurred on one side of our building. I could also tell that his family was not at home on Christmas Eve, and that this neighbor of mine was in a lot of anger and a lot of pain. I got in the car, and I, w I felt like a complete failure. Here I was supposed to be helping this church connect with its neighbors, and I had failed to foster a healthy and loving relationship with our nearest one. Despite having attempted to be friendly and warm to everyone, I met at the local coffee shop and passers-by at the church. I hadn't met this nearby neighbor. And the first encounter we had on Christmas Eve, no less, was one of anger, pain, confusion, and disappointment. So what did I learn from this encounter? I listed a few options, a few possible lessons. When beginning a new job at a new church, what if we clergy were encouraged not only to call every member in the directory and visit every homebound member, but we're also expected to knock on every door within a one-mile radius and introduce ourselves. If no one answers, we could leave a note. When something like a fire or another kind of an emergency occurs, I think we should err on the side of over-communication with those especially close to us. And after the experience with this neighbor, I made a commitment to find ways to move things to a different place. And we actually have a much, much better relationship now. And I'm actually incredibly grateful for that experience. Now that we've considered those that are the closest to us, our most immediate neighbors, let's go to the Acts of the Apostles reading, which I think, Brendan, you're going to read for us. Yep, yep. Uh, A reading from the Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? He invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shear, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak. 
and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed it to him, to him, the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to the eunuch, and the eunuch said, "Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized?" He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. So Philip found himself at Azotus, and he was passing through the region. He proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Oh, there is. All right, there we are. <laughs> so I noticed there, were, there was a question um, in the little chat box. What did I do? Um, and I will say that I have made, uh, and you'll see more as we progress to the presentation, what I and what my congregation chose to do. I wanted to begin uh, with a story of really feeling no love uh, immediately from that neighbor. Um, but we've really, at my congregation, uh, been focusing our attention on everyone in our immediate neighborhood um, without being obnoxious. So there's a fine line, I think. Um, but I want to go back to this story of Acts of the Apostles. It's an odd story, one of my favorites. And the reason I shared this with you in this web conference about going local is because I think it reflects the importance of being attentive to the spirit nudging us into relationship with strangers. I like that the Spirit doesn't tell us what to say. It doesn't tell Philip what to say. It, the Spirit apparently just said, go over to this chariot and join it. Perhaps we as a church, as church people, could benefit from being attentive to the Spirit nudging us to start walking alongside our neighbors a bit more closely. Maybe it is by visiting a local nursing home or introducing ourselves to the barista or joining a book group with non-church folks. Not because any of them are going to ask us to baptize them, but you never know. So uh, we're now going to go to this little section called Your Turn, and I want to invite two people uh, to share a story about a time that the Spirit has nudged them into conversations with neighbors in their neighborhood. And to start, I'm going to tell a story right there in the photograph. You've got this guy in a funny wig carrying a funny sign and another woman next to him. This is actually taken at a, at a street fair in San Francisco that happens. It basically moves throughout the city to different neighborhoods where they close off the streets and people walk and bike and ride their tricycle or their unicycle or what have you. Um, and the, the guy holding the sign, Why Not Every Sunday, is in a pretty close by neighbor of St. Cyprian, Morgan. And he's the head of a sustainability group called the Wig Party. And the Wig Party is about the Wiggle, which is a bicycle path that runs from one section of the city into deeper into the city, closer to the Golden Gate Park. And Morgan has been working with us at St. Cyprian's on a variety of projects. But I can assure you, he, uh, he sort of fits the type of uh, character um, at least in our immediate context, that for my congregation would be kind of a, an edgy outsider kind of guy. Um, and the woman next to him is Melinda, and she's a professor at the University of San Francisco and runs a community garden. And her students are using our kitchen space uh, to hold a free meal uh, once a month. Um, and that little sign, Turk and Lion, is actually the location of our church. So you can see we're kind of deeply local, and this is a photograph that kind of expresses that uh, desire to be in, in, in deep connection to our local neighbors. And neither Morgan or Melinda are members of our church, at least not yet, officially. So um, let's go to those, quest those stories. Who's got, uh, got their hands up and ready to share a story about a spirit, the spirit nudging them into a relationship with a stranger in their neighborhood? And Julie, if you'd like to share how we're going to, well, 
how about I go ahead and share? Um, so there are several ways of, of doing this. Um, this is Miguel. And um, you can, if you have a story, um, we invite you to raise your hand uh, and, um, and we will attempt to connect your microphone. And if that doesn't work, um, if you could enter your uh, phone number into the chat box, um, then we will uh, call you. Um, so I just saw Anna Olson, uh, who, uh, Anna? Can you say something so we can see if we can hear you? Um, and I'm not hearing you, but uh, we will call you because Anna is um, is actually the author of a really wonderful article uh, on ECF vital practices um, called "A Snapshot of Your Neighborhood." Um, so, Julie, we'll call you. I, I'm sorry, Anna, we'll call you in just one second. Um, it's a snapshot of your urban neighborhood, and it's a, a really wonderful tool um, that we'll uh, make available. So we'll hear from Anna in just one moment. If there's, if there's someone else uh, who would like to share a story, um, please just raise your hand, and we'll try to connect you in one of these two ways. Welcome, Melissa. Hi, this is Anna. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, Anna. Hi. Hi. Um, are you ready for me to say something, or am I just? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yes. okay. Well, I was just going to tell a little story. Um, uh, I'm from St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Los Angeles in a neighborhood called Koreatown, which is just west of downtown L.A. And um, almost a year ago, probably, I had a visit from um, a small delegation of uh, men who just kind of showed up one day and um, said that they had seen some groups rehearsing dance in our parking lot, which we occasionally um, allow people to do, and sometimes happens even when we don't allow people to do it, um, and that they wondered if they might be able to um, use the parking lot for a youth dance group that they were starting. Um, and so we talked about using the parking lot and um, kind of went through a, a series of things to kind of see whether we could do what they wanted us to do. They also wanted access to the building, to use the bathrooms, and um, there was some real trepidation on the part of my congregation about whether all this was a good idea, especially giving them keys. Um, but it's evolved into this relationship by which we have learned that there are 30 or 40 families living right around the church who are all from a tiny Zapotec-speaking town in southern Mexico that's about three hours from the city of Oaxaca. So if you know Mexico at all, it's really in the middle of nowhere. Um, and they all live within a few blocks of St. Mary's. And um, they are now we now have a Zapotec basketball team that practices in the parking lot, a band that includes a tuba and many beginning bra brass players that practice upstairs, and several dance groups, and it's just really evolved into this very interesting relationship. Um, but it did start with a little bit of a leap of faith where, uh, you know, this really unknown group came in, and I think just the fact that we gave them a chance actually was something they hadn't experienced from any of the other neighborhood institutions that they'd tried to connect with. Um, and none of them come to church. Every now and then, if I really make a special invitation, some delegation will show up for something, but um, it doesn't seem to be the primary thing that they're looking for. Um, but it's a growing relationship, and uh, it's been a little bit of a stretch for church members and also for my sexton. But um, it's you know, just an example for me of, of sort of having the door open and um, something pretty unexpected walking through. Thank you. That's a really beautiful story, Anna. And um, I think that like with Philip and with the Ethiopian eunuch and like I think any number of encounters that we have, uh, 
with strangers and neighbors, it takes some vulnerability on everyone's part and some risk. And uh, I love the fact that um, it began in one with one with one little thing, some dancing, and it's become it blossomed into this whole other uh, ministry of of not just uh, presence, but but they are actually witnessing to you perhaps uh, and to your congregation um, about a lot of different um, elements, you know, about who our neighbors are. And um, I love that you know something about the community that they're from, which is really beautiful. Are there, I think we, should we have one more? Do we have more time for one more uh, story, Miguel, or should we, should we move on? I, I, if, uh, absolutely, let's, let's go ahead. And we'll move forward. Keep going. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let's hear another story if we can. Okay. Who's ready um, for another? Who's got one? So again, if you'd like to share, uh, just raise your hand. Uh, there's a uh, on the toolbar at the very top. There's a little icon that you highlighted with a guy raising a hand. Uh, wave, wave at us. All right, Mary North. Got a story. Um, Mary, we're, we're going to try to, uh, with the microphone first, and then we might go to a phone. So, um, Mary, can you say something? Okay, so it doesn't sound like that's working. Um, so if, if you would like to uh, share your phone number in the uh, chat box, we'll then go ahead and uh, try to call you. It'll be just a moment. So one of the um, while uh, while Julie is, is calling Mary, um, I also included a link to Anna's article in the chat box, um, and it's a real. It comes with a great tool um, uh, resource for yourself as well. Um, so let's see if Mary has signed on. Mary, uh, are you there? Uh, I should be here. <laughs> oh, hi, Mary. How are you? How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I'm going to turn you off of my computer because I can hear two voices here. Ah, OK. Um, hi, Mary. Go ahead, Will. Tell us your story. Hey, Will. Uh, well, I'm in a uh, fairly rural area, and um, in a particular community, there are only several thousand residents, and so you don't come across as many strangers as you might in other places. But one Sunday, and not a Sunday, I was at the church in particular because I, I served two different ones. Um, a person was visiting from New York State. Um, I assume he was visiting relatives, came to our church uh, when the person who was conducting the morning prayer service um, got up to do the announcements. This man raised his hand in the middle of the congregation and said, do you mind if I come up and say a few things to you? And she said, well, why not? And this guy uh, stood up, came to the front of the church and witnessed to the church for about five minutes, not anything um, and then he sat back down, and he literally started the congregation in a direction where, um, you know, we'd, we'd been working toward, um, and he jump-started it to a point where people were saying, hey, I want to tell my story. And that's the power of what a stranger can do. It was remarkable. So it that's wasn't us out in the community, but it was the community or not really our community that came into us, yeah. So do you do you incorporate that into your worship now regularly, where there's time for people to share their story or witness? We will be. This was very recent. Yeah, we will That's be. Great. Great. Yeah, they were um, they were transformed by this. It was terrific. There there are a number of Episcopal churches that I know of, and we do this at St. Cyprian's now, where there's a sermon or a homily, and then there's a question, and the congregation is invited to share a story in response to the gospel. 
Um, but, but there are different ways to build kind of the, the power of testimony and witnessing into the liturgy. And I encourage that because it, it also, how we worship reflects how we also engage the world around us. And if we're, we're interested in building a relationship of mutuality and engagement, um, creating space for crosstalk and for, I, I don't mean crosstalk in the bad sense, but in the sense of uh, mutual conversation and engagement uh, where multiple voices and perspectives get shared. I think um, we can do that well in liturgy as well as, as doing that in the world. So thank you, Mary, very much. Shall we move on? Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and, and move to the next, uh, the next part of the presentation. Is that okay, Miguel? Sounds great. Great. So we're going to talk about location, location, location. I'm going to share a few stories. Um, but I'm going to begin uh, by suggesting that, that you look at this from a variety of different angles in the sense that there are many ways to look at your neighborhood. And there's data, kind of how to mine data online. There's something called Percept. And I think that Brendan and Miguel can probably point you to some ways that you can find those resources. They used to be really available easily on the Episcopal Church website. Um, but what I think is most important, um, more than the data about, well, who lives around me and what is their demographics and so on, is that we put a priority on building relationships with people um, that are not members of our church, um, that they know us, we know them, um, and we break, break the ice in whatever way we can. And we, make it, we just make it a part of what we're about, to look to our neighbors, to engage with them, to participate in their lives. So here's my, my first story about location perhaps not going so well. Um, my college town. The first one uh, is in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. I, I attended there when I was in college once. Um, as a nearby neighbor who had an extensive experience of the Episcopal Church growing up in my formative years, in elementary school and middle school and high school, I was on a diocesan committee in Virginia, and I attended regular meetings uh, and summer camp and so on of these diocesan events. I, I had a sense of the Episcopal Church and what it meant and what it was about. Um, but when I went there, I was really disappointed. Um, very few people spoke to me. And there, was, there seemed to be no relationship between my college or this, this church. Um, and I, you, know, you can tell this is a beautiful building. I'm, I'm sure the preacher was, was gifted. And they may have even had a nice endowment. But, um, I couldn't believe I was disturbed and uncomfortable with the fact that a college with 400 students just up the hill uh, from there had basically no relationship with this church. But I was surprised. I, I should say there was not no relationship, um, because a friend of mine at the college wrote a song. She grew up in the town. And she wrote a folk song. Um, you can actually download it on iTunes if you want to. Um, and here's the little the lyric from the song. It used to be a town of dirt and horses. Now it's all liquor and cars. There's still a whole lot of nothing up between those stars. Take the dog out for a walk on the Episcopal church lawn. My God, we're still trying to find a way to get ourselves beyond. And, and every time the crossing comes as a surprise, see me flying. Now, Great Barrington, by the way, is a lot more than liquor and cars. In fact, it was named recently the best small town in America by Smithsonian Magazine. Fortunately, a quick look at the St. James Episcopal website taught me that they have linked up with another Episcopal church and are starting a new parish together. And I think that's really wonderful, and it's kind of what a lot of places are now doing. But my gut tells me that for many, many years, this congregation neglected to pay attention to their surroundings and relied on the tried and true. And I know very little about the story of this congregation other than my experience as a student feeling ignored. The church, though, was in relationship with their neighbors, at least in the form of my friend walking her dog. Perhaps there were ways that this relationship could have been deepened and expanded upon. Instead of Meg singing regularly in the coffee shop across the street, what would it have been like for her to sing inside that old church building? So what is the lesson we can learn from that story? Um, if you have a college or a school nearby your church, 
be in relationship with them, somehow find a way to develop a connection. And I'm not suggesting that you start a college ministry. Um, that may not be the answer. Um, but at least try to seek folks out, either faculty or be a presence on campus. You know, usually there's some way, a bookstore, a coffee shop. Um, but start to break the ice a little bit and, and introduce yourselves to the church, uh, to, the, to the school or the college nearby. Okay, the next story I want to share is of a place I, um, I worked when I was in seminary, uh, actually right before seminary. It was for an internship. It's called St. Cyprian or St. Christopher's Church in Springfield. And this was a wonderful congregation. I spent a summer there as part of something called the Young Priest Initiative. And one of the greatest challenge, uh, challenges of this mid-sized church was the interesting mid-century architecture. It made the place feel insulated and cut off from its surroundings, as you can see. I actually kind of like the architecture as sort of a mid-century, uh, you know, it's sort of hip to be mid-century if you've got the, the cool Eames chairs and so on. Um, but this particular building uh, could use a little work, uh, buffering that sense of separation and cut-offness. The Baptist church next door, in its, in its sort of postmodern style, um, actually looks a bit more like a church and has a steeple. And they, they began, uh, before they built this building, uh, interviewing their neighbors door to door, asking what kinds of things folks in the neighborhood wanted to see. Um, and they, they seemed to be very successful, at least during the week. They were a lot more frequented by cars and people and foot traffic than the Episcopal Church. So what would it be like if the Episcopal Church, your Episcopal Church, engaged their neighbors um, asking them what their needs and their wants are? Um, and I'm not necessarily suggesting you ask them about their spiritual needs or their wants, but practical things. How would that, what might the church offer or what might they just wish to see happen that would enhance their life, their sense of well-being and connectedness? And the funny story about St. Christopher's was the only time I was there the entire summer that I actually introduced myself and talked to someone who lived in the neighborhood, not someone who went to the church, was when I got locked out of the church. Um, I was preparing a sermon, and I went for a little walk, and I, I, I got locked out. And uh, there was this guy sitting in the parking lot cooling his car off under a tree, and I went up and, and started talking to him because I, I didn't have a phone or anything. I didn't know what to do. I was like, ah, I'm stuck out of this church. So we started talking, and it turns out he was from India. And though I would have presumed that he wasn't Christian, he was actually raised Anglican. Um, and so we began a, a good conversation. But, but why does it take getting locked out of the church to actually engage with someone uh, who doesn't go to your church? That says a lot about, um, I think, sometimes our culture of insulation rather than uh, our, our, our culture of openness. So I want to I pose some more questions. Your turn. Um, let's next slide here. Where is it? So would you or your church be open to doing a community neighborhood need survey? Have any of today's participants done one? And perhaps we can have one or two people share what that experience was like. And if you haven't done a need survey or know what I'm talking about, there's actually in the materials uh, that Brendan and Miguel uh, have uploaded a way for you to, to download one of those and, and you know, give it a try with perhaps your vestry or your bishop's committee or, or a small group in your congregation. So has anyone ever done this before, done, done a neighborhood need survey? And what was that experience like? Anyone? And again, if you if you have and you'd like to share your experience, just um, press the again, raise your hand. Um, and I also put up for everyone the download files for becoming local. The neighborhood need survey is which one of which one is this? Uh, uh, it's the neighborhood uh, conversation conversation guide. guide. Thank you. So maybe simply in chat, um, 
if you uh, um, maybe simply in you have to hit the button download file. Right. You have, so you have click to click on the. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, if you go. have to click on the document and then uh, highlight it and then click download files, and ideally that should work. Um, okay. Uh, so. Um, so can I just try to someone try raising their hand? Like if you've done it, just go up to that little button that has the raising your hand and say, I've done this before. Raise hand. Anybody ever done it before? Anyone? Mary, Mary Norton. We, uh, <laughs> Mary's done it. Yay, Mary. <laughs> hey. Mary, are you on the phone still? She is not. No. Okay. Well, this may okay. tell us something about. <laughs> I'm glad you all are on here. I guess no one's ever done that before. Um, I'll tell you, I've done it. Uh, we did it with St. Cyprian's. Um, we actually did it with a number of other Episcopal churches, and we went to a variety of neighborhoods. Um, and it was quite an experience. I mean, we had some some eye-opening experiences in terms of uh, kind of greeting our neighbors, hearing what the circumstances of their lives are. Um, a lot of our current congregation, or at least at the time, a lot of our current congregation didn't live in the neighborhood or hadn't for many, many years. So uh, going around in the church's neighborhood and, and finding out just how different people's lives were um, from the impression, the, you know, the prejudices of the people inside the church, are, we thought, we thought um, certain things and discovered other things. We discovered that there were actually more and more younger families in our neighborhood, but few few programs and activities for them. We realized that there were quite a lot of students living in the neighborhood. We also learned that there were quite a few uh, kinds of group housing, uh, kind of halfway houses, supportive housing sites, um, which was not something uh, at least I wasn't aware of, and neither were our neighbor, uh, our, um, our our members of the congregation. So we learned a lot just by walking around, taking about two or three hours, and interviewing people on the street as they pass by or knocking on people's doors. So we're getting also some really oh, nice good. Ruth is saying something. Cool. Yeah, nice comments. Um, a number of people are saying that they've uh, done similar, something similar, but not quite a, a survey itself. Oh, that's neat. So Susan's saying that she 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 had an incarnational experience, or was that somebody else? I can't quite see. All right, Miranda, there we go. Beautiful. That's great. And I mean, I think I think the important thing is that these these tools don't get in, don't let them be a blockage to the relationship. Let them be an invitation to engage. Once the relate once you've said hi and you're chatting, you know, in some ways you can just throw the survey over, <laughs> have a relationship. Um, the most important thing is is developing a, a sense of of connectivity to your local place. Excellent. Looks like people are enjoying typing into this box. <laughs> and so Mary's saying that she had some, you know, some, sometimes the questions are kind of don't work in terms of where people are, which is very illuminating in its own way. So Dixie tells us about after-school programs. Excellent. So Miranda, um, one of the things I, I would encourage is, is just finding one person inside that building that you have a, trust, a, a trusting relationship with. Maybe it's a member of the staff, or maybe it's a member in, it, who lives in the building. St. Cyprian's actually did uh, Christmas Day services um, you know, it wasn't going to be, a, we have our big Christmas Eve thing, and 
we thought, well, what are we going to do on Christmas Day? So we did our service at a, at a supportive housing site for seniors. And it was, it was absolutely marvelous. I mean, the people were so hungry and grateful for our presence. And they actually asked us to come back and to do more kinds of Bible studies and things. So just find, and, it, and it really came about because one of the people who lived in the building really took it on as a project that, that she wanted to see more spiritual programming and reached out to us. So there was a, a sense of mutuality. And, and we, couldn't, we couldn't have done it without her kind of instigating it and holding, you know, kind of holding us accountable but also inviting her neighbors. But it went, it went really well, and I'm hoping for more of that to develop. I think um, Jim, Jim Scoppers uh, raises a really interesting po uh, question um, as well. Yes. Yeah. That's really helpful, Jim. So Jim's saying, that our neighbors actually have something to give us rather than us giving something to them. And I, I can attest that that's been the case big time at St. Cyprian's. I mean, we've had uh, numerous uh, neighbors giving to us um, in terms of art, graphic design, um, using our space for concerts and, and recitals. Um, and, and that's been really uh, deeply heartening. It's made our vulnerability seem like nothing compared to what neighbors have been willing to really risk in terms of their own sense of what the church might be or do for them, um, being willing to say, no, we have something to offer. We have something to give to you. Very helpful. But I think the most important, I mean, the, the reason for the survey really is a relationship. I mean, uh, and not, you know, I'm going to fix you. Nobody wants to really be in a relationship about <laughs> where someone's trying to always fix us. Um, and, and vice versa. I mean, we don't want to be the place that you know, is constantly being fixed by the neighborhood. So um, I think you know, that doesn't, you know, we want to cultivate healthy, life-giving relationships, affirming relationships for one another. Great. Um, so that's great, Mabel. You, it sounds like you have a very active uh, space. Um, and, and one of the, I actually had a member of my church encourage me uh, to go to my AA group. I mean, <laughs> maybe, I, maybe he knows something I haven't quite figured out yet. But he was saying, <laughs> he was saying, go to this AA group. You have to go not because I think you need to go to AA, but because I think you need to know the people that are there and see what a resource it is uh, for our neighborhood and our community. Um, and I think that that's a really important uh, recognition that sometimes we may be giving our space away, but what's needed isn't really you know, hosting, but really being an active and engaged participant or presence around those different groups that use the space. So I, I think sometimes it's, it's, it's about presence of the congregation and the clergy as much as it is um, giving to the neighborhood. So there's, a, there's maybe some work to do around building a relationship with those who use your space. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on to the next section. Is that okay, Miguel? Of course. Yes. Brendan? Yes. Okay. Thank you all for sharing. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about St. Cyprian. Um, it's a church filled with groups, a bit like uh, what we heard one of our chatters mentioning, that there are a lot of groups. And our neighborhood is full of groups. I frankly didn't really know that that was that was common. Um, but in our, our neighborhood, I'm just going to list a few of these different groups. There's the North of the Panhandle Neighborhood Association, the Divisive Darrow Street Merchants Association, this group, Nopa Little Ones for Parents of Small Children. There's a Panhandle Park Stewards. That's a part of the park that extends into our neighborhood. Um, there's the Whig Party, as I mentioned earlier, that are involved in sustainability and cycling. There's a group called Nopa Plus, which is a group that deals with kind of helping businesses that are wanting to network with each other, small businesses. Um, there's also the Village Project, whom we partner with. It's an after-school and summer program. Um, and so I'm inviting you to think about groups that are in your immediate neighborhood that you may currently not have a relationship with, or that you have a relationship with, um, or that, that's developing. Um, I think that sometimes congregations, especially St. Cyprian's, 
we weren't fully aware of all the organizing and the networking that was really happening around us until more recently. Um, so if, if anyone would be willing uh, to share a group that you're either partnering with now or one that you think, maybe I should work on that relationship. Maybe there's a Kiwanis Club or um, a, a, a guild that meets uh, somewhere nearby that you, you kind of wonder maybe we could partner with. Could you just uh, type one of those groups in the middle of the, the box, just list a couple of those groups there? And as people are doing that, um, Will, there's a, a really wonderful question from Anna Olson um, as, uh, asking if you could address the expectation in congregations that the purpose of outreach is getting more people to come on, to Sunday services. And she notes that this has been a point of tension in uh, her congregation. Um, and uh, it would be great to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I've, I've wrestled with that myself. I think that um, I think that the challenge is to say that the church, for so long, in many cases, has not been seen as a as a positive uh, presence or force in the neighborhood, and that um, primarily what needs to happen first is sort of dating. It's sort of like before you get married. Like I, I'd say Sunday morning for some people, uh, or Sunday evening, or whenever you have services. It's kind of like you're going steady or you're getting married, or you're like engaged. You, you've moved to a deeper point in the relationship. And the, to begin a relationship, you have to sort of date each other a little while. You have to sort of get comfortable with each other and, and decide how you feel. And it, it, you know, it takes a while. And, and sometimes you know, I have relatives that have dated their whole lives the same person, but they're not getting married. They love that person. That person's at every family dinner. They come to special events, but they just can't commit. And I think that the church should work on kind of using, <laughs> if that metaphor doesn't work for you, I'll try to work on something else. But I think we really could be better daters of our neighborhood and our community first before we try, you know, get down on our knees and say, you know, will you marry me? Um, and I think that, you know, we need to think about romance. I mean, how is our liturgy, you know, communicating to our neighborhood? Is it, is it, is, I mean, if, if our partner likes a certain kind of music and all we're playing is this other thing, you know, and if we've never even asked them, um, <laughs> if, we, if we've never asked them, what's your favorite music? Um, and just said, no, you have to listen to my stuff all the time. I mean, there's a sort of uh, cultivation that I think needs to happen. And, um, and trusting that ultimately, you know, eventually, there will be fruit that comes from the labor of really developing a relationship. But I also think we have to be willing to shift the way we do Sundays. We, we started with the help of a seminarian, uh, Hannah Cornthwaite, a new service um, for children and families. Um, at, the a at the asking of families in the neighborhood. And that's now, like, the attendance has doubled. I mean, in our, our Sunday attendance has gone, whoo, like that, just this, just this fall. Um, but we, were, we hired local people to help us with the music. We have a small group of families with kids that are kind of on this. They're like, we're going to be part of this. Um, and now we're, we've been invited to do some advertising about the service in the neighborhood. But, you know, we had to start dating people before we asked them to come to, you know, the wedding. Um, so there's lots of comparisons going on of uh, third, second base and third base and Sunday, <laughs> Sunday morning maybe a third base. Uh, but it sounds like it's a really great metaphor. Thank you. Okay. Mabel, are you uncomfortable or is the typing uncomfortable? Okay. I think um, Mabel's referring to her previous uh, note. Oh, okay. I have brought up evangelism with most church people who are comfortable with it. Um, and Julie is moving the chat box so that we can see more of what people are writing. And okay. So, I think the other thing that can happen with neighborhood groups, and and you know, you have to find a strike a balance between um, we're there for you, we're giving ourselves to you, and um, you know, what is our expectation of them? And I think that I've been working really hard to um, 
instill a sense of responsibility, not only on the part of my congregation for hosting, um, but also on the part of the neighborhood to say, look, you know, it's hard to keep a building going and pay the janitor and make sure there's enough toilet paper. And, you know, <laughs> so there's, you, there's also finding the right balance of saying to our neighbors, you know, you know, come on, you know, we're, we can't, we, we need you to be with us in, in, in tending to this space. Whether you come to Sunday services, whether you pledge, we do want you to give something back. And so I think being, being thoughtful about, you know, how to engage people in, in, in giving them a sense of responsibility and that the church can't just, it can't buy every meal on the date. I mean, it, it, there has to be some um, give and take. Bruce, I love your comment, Jesus didn't have a church or a budget, but let's pretend Jesus does have one now. And, <laughs> I mean, um, we have this responsibility. I mean, we could all just sell our churches and, and meet in the park, but, but these are buildings that have been given to us to be good stewards of. And, and I would try to say, okay, maybe Jesus doesn't have a build. He, he's got a lot of buildings, and uh, maybe our challenge is to think thoughtfully about how to, how to help those buildings serve the, the diverse needs around us. Um, Jesus was taking over other people's buildings. I mean, Zacchaeus, I'm staying at your house tonight. And, you know, maybe we could be more proactive in doing that some, too. Oh, okay. Sorry, Bruce. <laughs> All right. So let's keep going. I, I'm realizing that we only have a few minutes left. I'm going to show... Um, uh, this, is a this is a little still from one of my favorite videos. I grew up listening to REM uh, religiously, um, and I was really blessed when I went to church camp and realized that all the counselors liked REM too, um, and we could dance around to the music. Uh, but you'll notice that in this particular image from the video, you can Google stand REM, um, they are dancing on a compass, so um, a real sense of place is part of their song. Um, and I want to say that um, in, in, the, in the documents that are uploadable or downloadable, um, there are a bunch of questions. This is not the, the neighborhood conversation guide. It's the exegetical walk. Um, and it's really quite helpful. It just starts to open your eyes to the neighborhood around you and to your own local place. Um, and I want to just uh, kind of poke forward here on the um, PowerPoint. You'll notice that this is a building in our neighborhood. Um, and you know, in our urban context, there are lots of buildings that look kind of like, you know, I wouldn't say generic, but they, they are, you know, they're just building institutional style buildings. Turns out this is a building that was recently built um, using kind of green technology, but it's entirely uh, filled uh, up to about 40 residents who are our seniors who have been homeless. Um, and this is where we did our Christmas Day uh, service. It's only two blocks away from our church. And we're working to meet, meet our, 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 the residents of this building and find ways to collaborate with them. Um, there's another couple of buildings in our neighborhood. This one uh, that you can see on the, is, is a tower. Um, it's full of people with, who are seniors or people with disabilities uh, run by the housing authority. Um, and so, we actually, as you may know, coming from, I don't know where everybody is, San Francisco has some of the highest rent and uh, property costs in the country, um, but it also has a significant commitment to low-income people. And our neighborhood in particular is very mixed. I mean, we have people in our neighborhood who are spending well over a million on their condo um, or, their, or their Victorian that they're renovating. And you have people who are living in a very uh, low-income housing project um, with very limited, limited funds. Um, and so we've really been trying to be a church that is there for everyone, um, which certainly can create some conflict and tension. Um, but, but, but it also has been a creative experience to try to find a way to reach the, those in, in a more vulnerable place economically and also those who have who have quite a lot and, um, and in some ways need us to remind them um, to be present um, to those around them that may be in a little bit different situation. 
Um, so I, I'm not sure. I would imagine in rural con I grew up in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, and uh, there was a school right across from us um, that the church had a little bit of a relationship with. Um, there was a country store across the street, um, and there were restaurants that the preach that the priest frequented, and, and members of the congregation like to have meetings in. Um, but my hunch is that um, there are places and ways that that we could think creatively, even in rural settings or in suburban settings, where there's some distance between our space and where other people gather. Um, I was thinking also of a church that I worked in in McLean. It had a huge front yard, huge, gigantic, and they would use it maybe once a year. Um, and I always thought, gee, you know, what a perfect place to put a labyrinth or a garden, um, even a, a food production, you know, garden where you could do, you know, herbs and things, flowers. Um, so there's, there's ways that you can utilize your geography um, and your space to really be a, a connected presence to those around you. Um, I want to, this is a, a photograph from the North Panhandle, uh, or the Panhandle itself. If you look at a map of San Francisco, you'll see that St. Cyprian's is located just a few blocks from this Panhandle Park that links up to Golden Gate Park. And on St. Francis Day, which of course is a uh, patron saint of our city and of animals and of, uh, of ecology, uh, we hosted a, a bicycle blessing in the Panhandle, also a pet blessing. That's more traditional St. Francis. But we sort of spun it with bicycles because, of course, riding your bike is a pretty ecological thing to do. Um, and the, lucky for us, um, there was a concert in the Golden Gate Park, a bluegrass festival. So there were hundreds maybe thousands of people riding by on bicycles, some with their pets, um, who got their bike, bikes blessed. And we got to engage with our neighbors in a, in a different way, sometimes just uh, people on, you know, tourists going to the park. Um, but we, 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 we felt uh, really blessed by the engagement with our neighbors. And we actually had a little photo booth. You can see little St. Francis in the photo. And various people went by. And, and not everyone wanted their picture taken, but a lot, a lot of people did. And uh, this woman is holding a sign that says she got her bike blessed. Um, so you, you may want to take that as an invitation to think about specific liturgical or, or um, churchy things that you could take outside. Um, there may be, in, I know that in the city here in San Francisco, a lot of people will do Ash Wednesday outside at a, at a, at a subway stop or in the park. You know, some people, that's not their thing, uh, particularly with Ash Wednesday. I mean, it's kind of like going to your closet. So don't be like the hypocrites. It's a little, <laughs> sometimes you have to break some rules or, or play with the idea of space and place, uh, what would be appropriate. But, um, you know, it's going to be different on the depending on the context. Here uh, is a, an old sign of St. Cyprian's in our little garden. Um, we were kind of, uh, I, wanna, I don't want to say we were, neglecting our building, but, but we, were, we were not thinking about kind of how it looked to our neighborhood and our community. Um, and so uh, we've been working on that. And you can see that we've got our building painted. And we changed our sign uh, so that it was more communicative of who we are now and who we aspire to be. Um, this is actually at a barbecue that, that we hosted um, as a fundraiser for our kitchen. Um, and I'm thinking that may be it. We are one minute down. And uh, amazingly, I think I have said everything I want to say. I hope this has been helpful to you all. Um, and I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to read everything in the, uh, the, the chat, but I hope I'll be able to do that. Um, I want to remind you of the resources that are available. Uh, the Neighborhood Walk, which is more um, kind of looking out at your neighborhood and exploring it the other being more of a conversation guide. Um, and I, said, I think, Miguel and uh, Brendan, you want to close this down or tell me what's, oh, oh, next. What happens next? Oh, There's what happens? Another one. There's another one. Next week, you can come back yes. for more. Um, yeah. Next week uh, is going to be more about how um, you can involve your neighbors in planning, um, more about long-term visioning and how you can engage them in that project. So the other, the final um, piece.
piece is um, all of all of you, because you registered, um, are going to be attend are going to be receiving a recording of this uh, web conference, a PDF of the slides, a link to the resource sheet, and of course a link to our survey, which I want to remind you about at this at this moment. Um, and the important links, um, please click the section. Please click the link. Give feedback on part one of becoming local um, and uh, so that you can um, let us know um, uh, so that you can let us know how the how how it went and um, we will we'll be uh, improving you know as we go forward in general both in terms of ETF and then also we'll give feedback to Will. Um, someone is asking an important question will the copies of the PowerPoint file be available for download they are available for download uh, right right now um, and, and I see that you're actually saying that uh, it's funny. So the PDF of the local PowerPoint is the final um, is the final uh, document uh, under a download file for becoming local. You click on it, and in most cases, then the button download file, and you should be able to uh, download it to your own computer. Um, so um, Will, I don't know if you want to. Uh, have any any final thoughts? But that that was it. I please take the survey. We come back next week. To look at our yes, and and come back next week. All right. Bless you. <laughs> oh yes, um, Brendan is reminding me to offer contact information. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this is uh, Will's contact and, information. Being Cyprian's is on Facebook, and and we have uh, a presence online. So please check out our our website and newsletter and all that stuff. Great. And then if you have uh, any more in depth comments that maybe a, a survey will not help, or you just want to learn more about the fellowship partners program, or ETF vital practices, or any of the programs that we've mentioned. Um, here is the contact information for Leadership Resources at the Episcopal Church Foundation. And oh, he's, um, on, he's on mute. What? Okay. Would it help if I stayed? Do you want me to stay for questions or anything? Hello. Hello. Yes. Um, should I? Should I? Am I done? Am I clear to go, or should I stay and see if anyone has any questions, or what? What would Let, be helpful? Let's stay to about eight ten. Um, okay. And and then just you know, if people have questions, uh, we invite you uh, to continue to chat them. Uh, we're going to probably end at uh, this Eastern time eight ten. Um, okay. So that, I can do that. Uh, all of us over here in New York can head home. <laughs> um, Um, it's also important, I think that the, this has been recorded, so those who weren't able to get the first part of the presentation, um, you can watch it online. Yeah. And if you'll you be to raise your hand. I'm sorry, Julie, could you say that again? Oh, if you have a question, please raise your hand, yeah. Um, and for those who are signing out, thank you. Thank so you, much. Mary. Thanks for sharing. Uh, thank you for for uh, participating, and look forward to seeing you next week. I feel like I'm the guy at the church at the door, like shaking people's hands on their way out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, that was really great. Thank you. <laughs>